Hello, everybody. So um, I'm Vittorio Banfi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bot Society. Uh, before we start, I want to make an experiment. Uh, how many of you have ever received an email uh, that said Vittorio from Bot Society in the subject? All right, cool. At least 10 people. That's great. Um, so I, I'm, I have a virtual clicker here. So I'm just going to click looking at Dustin intensely. I'm the CEO of Bot Society. Bot Society is a conversation design solution. We help your uh, creative team and product team to imagine, iterate, and design your conversational experience. And it doesn't really matter whether it's on voice or chat, uh, we got you covered there. And uh, we're the biggest platform out there for conversational design. Collectively, our users have designed 3.2 million messages. We, our biggest investors are Google and 500 startups. That's some of our clients. And we also have an educational program with more than 80, 80 universities, 2,000 students. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. It's um, what I want to talk about today is why you should design your bot, or generally speaking, your conversational experience. And uh, I'm going to tell you some reasons. And I'm going to tell you the ways to spot whether you actually need to design a conversation interface or not. So if you're a manager, that's another way of asking the same question, right? It's like, why should I invest in conversation design? So I came up with these three patterns that we're seeing uh, in our experience working with a lot of companies. So the first one is the user experience. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about engineering optimization and natural language processing optimization. So let's talk about user experience, right? So if you take um, the stance of, if you take the um, point of view of, a, of the user who has a problem or the user who wants to buy a product from you, um, these are the choices that the user will have. You can go on your website, you can download your app or go on your mobile website or you can call up your IVR system, most probably, right? And so when you're building a bot, you're adding another interface there, um, which is going to be here. What happens is you're giving your user different doors. That's one way to visualize that, right? Different doors to interact with you. And each of the previous doors had a design team that worked on it, that refined it, that iterated that user experience a lot. And then you come up with a bot or a voice interface that has not been designed, and it will show. <laughs> so you're basically presenting your users with this choice, and you're gaming it. Right? So users, your, the user expectations that you're setting up are that each interface is beautifully designed. And so usually the way to spot this is that you, have a, you see a lot of frustrations from the users using your conversation interfaces and or a general lack of usage. Um, and that's usually because of the four doors experiment that you're running. You're basically running an intelligence experiment to your users. It's like, do you, are you choosing the well-designed, craftily, thoughtfully selected interface or the other one? <laughs> so uh, that's the thing that you want to avoid. Because those are the user expectations that have been created. So, you want to dedicate the same design, careful design to the new interface. So this was user expectations. Engineering optimization, what I mean by that. So, um, and I'm sure there's developers in the room, when you're trying to solve a problem um, from an engineering perspective, you want the problem to be crisply and detailed when you approach it. You don't want to have a loosely defined uh, problem. So, um, and the key word here is in detail. So what I mean by that is, if you want to keep, from, from a management point of view now is, if you want to keep your engineering team on track and use the talent that you have, you need to crisply define the problem. And so let me make an example here. So a loosely defined problem is something like this. We want the users to purchase the products. We want to add stuff to the shopping list and confirm it later. This is an example, right? Now, 
this is not very well defined. So what will happen is that your engineering team will either have to fill in the gaps with their own decisions about how the user experience should be, or they, should, they will get back to you and ask you a lot of questions. And so this is a longer slide, and you don't need to read it, all of it, but the idea is you want to crisply define the problem for your engineering team on a level of detail that is good enough for me as an engineer to come up with the technical solution in the way that you expect it to be, right? So in this example following here is like a series of questions to authenticate them. That, that will be the first step of a purchase process, right? Because I want to know who the customer is, for example. If they don't have a credit card, then we ask for it. And if, if they have, then we proceed, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to arrive to a definition of the problem, which is detailed enough. And so how do you spot if you have this problem? It's, it's usually frustration on both sides. So <laughs> business is frustrated because the actually like also to talk without microphone. Um, and, and the engineering team uh, is frustrated because he, he continuously have to interrupt the work and go back to business and say stuff like, what happens if the user says this? What happens if the user says that? Maybe some of you have experienced that, right? So like all the edge cases are not defined and so the, the, the progress is not showing. So this is engineering frustration, that's another, or optimization, right? Then if you have been working with bots, um, you have seen that you also have the natural language processing section, which is kind of separate from the engineering part in that, okay, you have your framework, the bot is rolling, and then you need to train your natural language processing instance, right? And so it, basically just a quick primer, that's how, you can look at a bot structure, regardless of the technology that you pick, right? You have a channel, like, say, the Google Assistant or the SMS. Um, you have a natural language processing engine, like Rasa or Dialogflow. And then you have a dialog manager. Um, you can use Rasa for that as well. It's amazing, right? OK. So what happens is, um, let's focus on the NLP part. Um, so basically, the NLP part is, is something like this, right? So like, you have a list of intents, and then it's like, that's how you express this intents. That's one utterance, utterance one, utterance two, right? And then you have intent two with his, his own utterances. So what happens is, if you don't design your bot, um, you actually don't have a very good map of all the intents that you want to have in your bot. So basically what happens is you release with this first set of intents. In this example, there are three, right? Then you go on production, the UX kicks in. <laughs> and what that means is since you didn't design this carefully, the user expectations will cre create the need for a new intent. So basically the users will keep asking about something that you didn't anticipate because you didn't preview it. We didn't prototype. You didn't go through the design iteration, right? And so what happens at that point is that you are going to have another intent. Um, and that's where the thing gets complicated, because the problem with natural language processing is that now you don't need only to teach about the new utterances of intent four, but you will probably also need to figure out how to not trigger intent three by mistake or intent two. In other words, the moment that you add an additional intent, you always run the risk of having to retrain part of the previous ones in order to make sure that the new intent um, is identified correctly. So for example, let's say the one intent is new booking. Uh, so it allows you to buy a new plane ticket. And intent, the new intent that you're adding is uh, changing a booking. Now you need to figure out the difference between those two, and you need to retrain your NLP again. So basically, you're losing a lot of time in NLP training. And this is not due to your data scientist not working correctly. It's just because you didn't design the map of your intents um, in a detailed enough way to allow them to map all of them previously. Um, and so this was NLP training optimization. So those are three main areas that we've seen where um, that basically allow you, if you actually design bots, to 
uh, meet this expectation, meet the user experience expectation in terms of how good um, an experience is, meet the engineering expectation in that once they have a design file they can refer to, is detailed enough so they can provide and go fast in their engineering efforts. And on the natural language processing side, once you have a complete map of all the intents, you don't need to go back and retrain them on the fly after production kicks in um, because the map is, is complete enough. And that's about it. Thank you, Slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. We're going to do a couple of things. Um, so if you have a little bit of time, I feel a little generous. And I want to give away these Echo Dots. So okay. I'm going to give three tickets per question. We're going to do three questions. Questions. One, two, and three. When, when deploying a new chatbot, like you said, there's not going to be a lot of intent that, uh, that you are able to think about. How could you minimize the impact to the user when you don't have everything they're going to be asking about, but at the same time, you don't want to get them frustrated because the chatbot keeps apologizing for not knowing that information? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. So um, one of the things that we see um, it's very successful is um, you iterate on the design before actually building the intent structure, right? So if you schedule a phase where instead of thinking about intents, you just focus on the user experience, um, and you create an initial design, and then um, you show it to potential users, and you see what they ask about, and which expectation that type of question and personality creates, then you can minimize the amount of um, I would say unexpected intents once you move on to production. And if you think about it, you, you're already doing that in the website and mobile app world, right? So like when you're releasing a new mobile app or a website, you don't actually just rush and code it unless you're a one-man band uh, in his kitchen. Okay, that's different. But like if you're a team, then you just don't come up with a website, right? Um, because then the reason, the, the, the problem is you, you, you release it and then people don't click on the button and then you need to rework the website, right? So you create a design, you show it to other people in the company, you show it to potential users, and then you minimize the risk of people not clicking on the button. So, so if you take the same approach, the same workflow, and you just flip it for the conversation design world, that's a very good way of avoiding uh, unintended um, or unexpected intents in production. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Uh, so when uh, you are uh, designing a conversational design for a particular channel, when you are designing a conversational design for a particular channel, then actually you might have done the NLP optimization for that particular channel. When you are extending that to a, another similar kind of a messaging kind of a channel, is there any best practices or anything actually uh, your tool will provide? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I got a question. So best practice about the yeah, channel? Yeah. Two questions. Actually, yeah. One is actually the thing is you have talked about NLP optimization. You, you, you mentioned about NLP optimization. What are the things your tool will, you, are, you will provide? Yes. Uh, similar the way for the conversational design, do you provide any support for optimizing conversational design? For on the NLP side? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, what you can do with Bot Society is you create your design you map your NLP without still moving on to the building mode, so you're free to change it in a very fast way. Like, you can drag and drop, right? Um, and then we have very powerful integrations with any NLP engine that your engineering team will end up using. So we work with the Raza team, with the Dialogflow team. Uh, we're going to announce a partnership with the Microsoft Bot Framework team. Uh, and so basically then you take this design data and you transfer it into your NLP so you already have the structure and you just need to train it a little bit more on the technology that you pick. But you don't have to copy paste everything again. Okay. So do you provide any kind of a mock testing saying that actually the, this one actually with Facebook Messenger how it will work? Suppose if I wanted to, whatever the conversation design I have done for 
Facebook Messenger, I wanted to extend it to, I wanted to make it available in Slack, will we be able to use the same optimization or any? Right, yeah, you can use, you, you can, you can uh, use two different, now I got the question, sorry, I didn't get it before. So you can use two different workflows. Um, so the first workflow is you use exactly the same interaction, say that you built on Messenger, you, you use it on Slack. That's one thing that you can do. That's okay. Uh, another thing that you can do with Bot Society is you convert the format from Messenger to Slack. And we help you do that with a conversion feature. So basically, you have side to side the two different um, experiences, and you can pick. So you can leverage like each platform capabilities. So for example, like in Slack, you can have multiple people talking, uh, or you can have a different button set of buttons and, and this kind of stuff. And so you you basically convert it to the new format, and then you can export it again on on your NLP engine while keeping all the other things. So you basically just um, uh, change the part of the conversation, or I should say, I should say, adjust the part of the conversations that uh, need to be adjusted given the new channel. Sure. Okay. Um, question is: um, Does your conversation change uh, communication? You know, channel to channel, like he was asking. Like, it, does an enterprise? Uh, let's say you're designing a conversation and you're designing it for both uh, Slack and Facebook Messenger. Uh, do you find that the design is slightly different for an enterprise customer versus you know, like a regular customer, consumer uh, on Facebook? So do you actually tweak your design so the conversation is different? And uh, how many people do you typically have in your fo focus group when you're designing a conversation? How, uh, I'm sorry, the second question, how many people? Yeah, how many people do you typically have in your focus group when you're designing a conversation? Oh, okay. So two questions. That's great. Yeah, so w we see both approaches. So we see teams coming up with one interaction and then just adjusting it for a different channel. So for, let's say from Slack to Messenger, right? Um, and that's usually the case where you're basically building a Slack bot for a prosumer segment. So not internally, but externally. And so it's an external bot on Slack. It's an external bot on Messenger. It's the same use case. You just tweak it, right? Um, then we see another type of um, bots, which are kind of like the internal bots. So they're not in the open there. So and, and that usually, uh, the design changes dramatically when depending on the use case, right? So if switching from Slack to Messenger means that you need to change the use case, uh, then in that case, of course, you need to redesign the whole interaction just because the, the use case is, is different. Um, we also see another thing where we offer a generic channel which is kind of like an abstraction of all different channels. And so we see a lot of teams starting their design there. I should not raise my hands because it's been sweaty. Um, they, see, they see them starting there, and then they kind of, um, uh, once they have this generic abstract interaction, then they adjust it for each channel. So they say, okay, now let's adjust it for Messenger, for our website, for our mobile app like this. Um, in terms of focus groups, it really depends on um, um, the type of use case. Um, and um, I can say that at least, um, so let, let me say it a little bit different. So if you're running user testing, um, uh, qualitative user testing, you can have um, a small number, like five or 10 people. But qualitative user testing implies that you're spending some time with them. You're asking some question at the end of the interaction. Um, so you're showing them basically how it, like one of our customers is an airline, and they're lucky enough that their office is in the airport. <laughs> and so they just step out, and they were showing the interaction to, to users. So 10 users was enough, because they could see how they were interacting. If it's remote, then you, you get less data out of it. So we see at least 30 or, or 35 folks there um, if, to test one use case. So if you have then multiple use cases, then you multiply. Let's give a round of applause, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much.